Now, this is an act in three parts. The first part's very short, but it's me. Um, <laughs> one of the things that members um, fairly often ask me, they go, well, I hear about all these nonprofits. How in the world do they all relate to each other? What do they do? And what I like to describe this way is it's the kind of question you're asking. With the case of the Spring Island Trust, you know, we use the name Low Country Institute out uh, when we have to uh, show we're neutral ground. Yeah. And also with the Cornwall Sound Foundation, it's all about education. We're asking the why question. We're telling people why is this important and getting them so that they are seeing the world differently and understand what the significance is. Um, then there's also, well, what needs to be preserved? And the Nature Conservancy and the Open Land Trust are the ones that often identify those places that need to be set aside. The really tough question becomes how. How do you do this? And that's a real challenge because you have to know about the moving parts and you also have to work with government and you have to work with communities. And that's a lot of people. I don't like working with people when they're in those kind of situations. And that's why I love working with Coastal Conservation League because they're the ones that know how to do things. Dana and I have known each other since before there was Coastal Conservation League and before uh, I was ever even knew what Spring Island was. So we go way back. And what I asked him to do to set the stage uh, is I wanted him to uh, describe four situations where to give an example of what it takes to make something happen. However, he reminded me that that was about a four-hour talk, <laughs> and uh, so I had to uh, revise that. And he's going to take us through one example, and in particular, uh, he's going to show one that's in our area, and paying attention to how things happen, what are the dynamics. And uh, because Dana has had the vision to create the Coastal Conservation League, the other part that I've learned a lot about is sustainability. And so I've asked Laura Cantrell, after Dana gets a brief, his brief part, to then come up and talk about uh, from her perspective, because she is the successor uh, to Dana. And, and then I'll just wrap it up there. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the storyteller, Dana. But before I do, just real quickly, for those of you that like credentials, he graduated magna cum laude. A lot of from Davidson College, I think some of you have heard that from around here, and a degree in mathematics, got an MBA from Wharton School of Pennsylvania, worked in New York City for a while, and that straight just hit out where he didn't want to be, um, <laughs> and uh, went to work as a legislative assistant for Congressman Arthur Ravenel Jr., that's when I first got to know Dana, and he's been a recipient of a variety of awards, including the Order of the Palmetto, which is given by the state of South Carolina Time Magazine, for kids, they found one of the heroes of the planet, uh, and he was the author of the Pew Oceans Commission, Coastal Sprawl, the Impacts of Development on Aquatic Ecosystems in the United States. In 2015, named a Hero of the Seas by the prestigious Peter Benchley Ocean Award. So with that, let's turn it up to Dana. Thank you. All right, that worked. Yep. Okay, check that. Warming up. Um, thank you so much. It is great to be here. And um, I will tell you that uh, one, of the, one of my earliest uh, experiences, I guess, in what I call ex uh, intentional natural history was when Virginia and I took a shorebird uh, seminar up at, I think it was Baruch, and Chris was teaching it, and he got us hooked on... Um, on, on shorebirds, and we began to do shorebird surveys in a friend of mine's boat that was affectionately called the garbage barge, which, uh, and, it, and it, it most of the time ran, ran, and it most of the time made it back to the dock. Uh, and Chris has been trying to tell me the difference for the last 35 years between semi palmated sandpipers and least sandpipers, and he still helps me understand that every so often. So it's, it's wonderful to be here. And 
Um, I love coming to Spring Island. I'm going to go bird watching with Chris in the morning. And it is just such a perfect, exciting time. And so much so that we were um, having lunch today, Jerry Milbank, who's on our board, and I with um, the Morowitzes, and we walked out of the golf house and were standing on the steps. And up above us flew, soared, uh, it, not even a verb that is adequate to describe what happened, a swallowtail kite. And in its talons, it had a small, what I think was a snake, and it literally could have come off the pages of the Audubon print that y'all probably are familiar with of the swallowtail kite. It was so beautiful, just the, one of these moments that only really happens on Spring Island at the golf house. <laughs> um, so it is wonderful to be here, and um, Again, I've, so many people I've known and admired and, and enjoy seeing. I'm going to talk tonight about uh, some land, how many of the land use policies that, that we sort of take for granted in Beaufort have been around for a couple of decades actually had their origins and inspiration in an institution that was born more than a century earlier during the Civil War. And that institution, many of you know, is, was the Penn Center. The Penn, this is Frizzell at Penn. I'm going to focus on the Conservation League's work with Penn to help build a, the capacity and the political power of residents of St. Helena and the other Sea Islands to, to really take control of their own destinies, to protect their, their communities from uh, the sprawl, the development that was occurring really up and down the coast, not only, of course, in South Carolina, but literally from Florida up to um, Boston and even Maine. Uh, this is the first chapter, the th third chapter, sorry, in the book that uh, is out, the history of the Coastal Conservation League called A Holy Admirable Thing, written uh, by one of the most objective historians in South Carolina, my wife. <laughs> so you can be sure that every good thing in there about me is true. And um, it's, the, it's the third chapter. And then, interestingly, Grove Foods Carolina, uh, which I think Laura will probably give you an update on because some exciting news about that, is the last chapter in the book. And that was sort of our second foray, in a way, in a big way, into the economic development arena. And you know, as if what Chris was presenting wasn't complicated enough with land conservation and advocacy and education, adding on top of that this, this historical layer of culture and the need to really understand that in a way that we even those of us who grew up in South Carolina may not have, have, have done, uh, in order to be successful in this arena makes this, I think, the most fascinating endeavor that can, we can undertake, and I maybe am biased on that. So the story begins on St. Helena. Y'all know that island, I'm sure. It retains today a living Gullah culture where descendants of enslaved Africans who uh, had created a community that was steeped in spirituality and interestingly was almost unknown to the rest of the world for over a century. The St. Helena is at, at Land's End and there is a road on St. Helena called Land's End Road and Virginia describes it, uh, the island as having miles of dirt roads that twist and splinter out like the branches of the live oak trees and tidal marshes that weave through the island. Despite its proximity to Beaufort and to Hilton Head, the people and the landscapes have endured with relatively little change through the legacy of the Civil War, through Reconstruction, through the hardship of a Jim Crow South. The Conservation League was founded in 89, about 126 years after Penn's founding and 110 years after the end of Reconstruction. As the 20th century was 
coming to a close and the 21st about to begin, St. Helena and, and virtually all of the other islands in the Low Country were at great risk from speculators and developers who were really promoting essentially a rural gentrification that could have forever scattered these communities and altered the traditional landscape and on top of that caused a great deal of environmental damage. And this is where the Penn Center story begins, the modern story. But let me go back a little more than a century and um, say that three and a half years before the end of the Civil War, and I'm guessing many of you know some of this, but even I didn't know much of it growing up in South Carolina. On November the 1st, 1861, there, it was a day that Islanders remembered as the day of the big gun shoot. And it, it, what happened was a fleet of 15 Union uh, boats sailed into Port Royal Sound, downriver of Beaufort. Uh, the boats bombarded the forts at the entrance to the Sound, and they drove the Confederates, uh, the Confederate soldiers out. And thus began what has been called a rehearsal for reconstruction, an experiment that was conducted on the Sea Islands that would literally change the course of American history. The slave owners, the plantation owners, the white residents virtually all fled in the face of the Union forces. And they left behind their houses, their possessions, including 10,000 uh, African slaves representing the, at the time already 80% of the population. They chose to stay put. The federal troops seized control of the waterways and the Sea Islands as well as, as, well as the town of Beaufort. Um, and the legal status of the slaves who were essentially free, by, de facto free, was very much still up in the air because the invasion occurred over a year before the Emancipation Proclamation. While the Civil War raged on elsewhere, African Americans in, on Hilton Head, on St. Helena, Ladies Island, were part of this newly liberated territory, would for the first time enjoy uh, a taste of freedom. Although under military command and an evolving and very contradictory, in many ways, federal administration, the U.S. government partnered with uh, anti-slavery and religious societies in the North to raise revenues and recruit volunteers to help these uh, former slaves become self-sufficient. <clears throat> this was known, this whole exercise was known as the Port Royal Experiment. Um, it attracted philanthropists, missionaries, politicians, military leaders, and fortune seekers. And um, according to C. Van Woodward, who you know is one of the great Southern historians, they crowded the Sea Islands to contest with each other over the destiny of these emancipated slaves. The Port Royal experiment was the prelude to Reconstruction, which itself, while short-lived and was only about 11 years long and fatally flawed, scholar W.E.B. Du Bois called a splendid failure. It represented an era of tremendous progress of, for formerly enslaved black people. Reconstruction prepared the nation for what freedom and equality for all Americans could look like. For a dozen years after the Civil War, newly freed men served in the state legislature. They served in the U.S. Congress, black men in the U.S. Congress, no women yet. Uh, African Americans could go where they wanted to. They were paid to work. Freed slaves no longer needed to live in fear of being sold, captured, and sold. They founded towns and churches and schools that were formerly illegal began to proliferate the South. This one is actually a picture from a, a not re Reconstruction, but not too much later than that, Penn School. Uh, in the early 1900s. The former slaves uh, had a thirst for education and were 
eager to what would they call catch the learning. One northern uh, journalist observed that porters in stores, laborers in warehouses, cart drivers on the streets, often carried spelling books with them to study in the moments they had to take a break. Many southern black communities taxed themselves to start new schools. Children taught parents who were weary from working in the evening how to read. It was a remarkable time. I love this, I love this picture. It's so beautiful. Um, this is on St. Helena, by the way. Uh, this same zest for learning was evident uh, three years earlier among these contraband, so-called contraband uh, residents of the Port Royal experiment, and the owners, the owners had, had vanished on the big, day, big gun shoot day. Charles Sumner, who, as you know, was the abolitionist senator during that era from Massachusetts, called for assistance and noted the urgent need to educate the contrabands, as he described them. By 1864, there were almost 100 schools operated by 100 teachers on the Sea Islands. And many were funded by northern freedmen, societies that were set up, associations, the sale of cotton cultivated during the experiment by the uh, freed slaves themselves. One of the best Beaufort area schools was founded by Ellen Murray and Laura Town that was called the Penn School in honor, of course, of William Penn. And it was supported by donors in the state of Pennsylvania. The un Laura Town was a fascinating person and, and unlike most of the missionaries who came down during Reconstruction, she remained here the rest of her life in South Carolina and worked on, under the, the belief and compulsion that she had, uh, you know, subscribed to that uh, young black men and women could become great citizens. On September 22nd, 1862, Laura Town and Ellen Murray launched the Penn School in the Brick Church, Big Baptist Church on St. Helena, with 41 students in attendance. Now, the, as you all know, I think uh, we now have a, a national designation, historic designation, that includes seven or eight, I know Mike's nodding, he knows I'm sure precisely which buildings, but one is, is the Brick Church. Uh, that are part of this uh, Reconstruction National Monument. And there's more attention being paid, fortunately, on this era in history than has ever been paid before. Penn operated the Penn School as a community center, as an agricultural center, as a school for almost a century. And then in the 50s and 60s, um, it took up the mantle of social justice and became an important hub for community organizing during the Civil Rights Movement and served as a meeting place for Dr. Martin Luther King, among others, and the staff of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, a safe place for mixed race gatherings in an area, era of de jure, actually de jure and de facto segregation. There was a cottage named for Dr. King is a cottage on the marsh side of the property some of y'all have probably visited. Later, the Peace Corps used the Penn Center uh, as a training ground for volunteers heading to Africa. Eventually, Penn became an important site in South Carolina as a repository for the heritage of Gullah culture. It was, that was part of this new mission to promote and preserve the history and the culture of the Sea Islands. And in 1974, the campus with 17 historic structures, let me ask people, how many people have been to Penn Center here? Everybody, of course, wonderful, and it's such a, an, an inspiring and beautiful place. Along with eight other sites on St. Helena were designated a National Historic Landmark District. Emory Campbell, the executive director of the Penn Center from 1980 through 2002, and a founding board member of the Conservation League, 
address the question, what is Gullah? Emily, em, Emory wrote, I, am, I was nearly half a century old when I realized that the culture in which I was born, Gullah, contained uniquely rich folklores and a fascinating distinguished idiom. I realized the waterways and the Atlantic Ocean that encircle my native Hilton Head and other islands keeping us far from mainstream America for many years had also kept our culture relatively pure. Our fellow African Americans had known us as Geechees, scholars had known us as Gullahs, and I suddenly realized that for the greater part of my life, perhaps I had been more African than American. At the time of the founding of the Conservation League in 1989, St. Helena and the other sea islands were on the cusp of being overrun by rampant, poorly planned development. Sprawling suburbs, exclusive resort plantations such as those found on now Defusky and Hilton Head were already displacing historic Gullah communities. By persuading one family member to sell a piece of, of land that was owned uh, jointly and with no will, by the way, passed down generation after generation, uh, a developer could force what was called a partition sale and acquire the remaining pieces of the property uh, on the courthouse steps. For many island black uh, people whose distinctive language, music, cuisine, and arts made them perhaps more African than any African Americans elsewhere in the country, the loss of the land is that first quote that Emory, uh, from Emory on the first slide said, meant the loss of community and culture. These were, as Emory has said, a people of land. The Gullah are a people of land. In 1992, I got a call from Nina Moraes de Cordova, who is this lady with the dark glasses on. She has an interesting background. She grew up in Toledo, Ohio. She had a physics degree from Amherst, a master's in history from Harvard, and a law degree from Yale. <laughs> you know, so, you know, she was sort of a strange commodity to us down here. She talked to me, she said, I want to do something to save the Gullah culture. I was connected to her by a good friend of mine and a board member who also had gone to Yale Law School, but a lot earlier. Um, it took us a long time to figure out what that meant. And we still don't really know exactly what it meant. But we took a, a leap of faith and hired her. And it was my feeling, it's been my feeling over the years that when you run into somebody like that, which you rarely do, you hire them and then you figure out what they can do later. <laughs> and that was a good decision, I'll say, on that Nina's part. Nina remembers things this way. She said, I was a northern white female, Jewish, Ivy League educated, coming into a small, tight-knit island community as a complete outsider. It was nothing like anything I'd ever experienced. And I came in as an educator, but the people of St. Helena taught me much more than I could ever have taught them. Emory helped us appreciate that the, if the preservation effort that we were envisioning was to be successful, it had to be built on the pens and emerge, he, he said, and we were also convinced, from Penn's 130-year history and ethic. Nina eventually conceived of a new program she called the Penn School for Preservation and resurrected the name Penn School which had, about the Penn School had really stopped operating in the 50s, um, and advertised it as starting the old Penn School all over again. And there were many, many graduates, in fact, maybe a good bit of the population on St. Helena, uh, who, had, who were Penn graduates. The goals of the new program were modern day versions of questions that were really essentially the same ones that face the nation during Reconstruction. And they were basically these. How can we find economically viable alternatives for people who live on these sea islands, alternatives to destructive development? And two, can island natives master the technical information and develop the leadership skills necessary to gain control over their destinies? Nina said, 
emphatically answered both of those questions. Yes, she believed, and she found that St. Helena's leaders were proud, self-sufficient, politically aware, and active, but they lacked the technical expertise, especially on land use and environmental issues, and there was a complete disjunction between the island community and the county seat in Beaufort where the decisions were being made. She said, some, quote, someone should write a book about the Penn School ethic. At the first Penn School, the, the first one in the early, in the 19th century, people learned every human virtue you can imagine. Honesty, courage, compassion, perseverance. Every single thing you would want a human being to do as a child of your own to grow up to be is what Penn taught. The Penn ethic was so deep and it set the tone for the island Many of, the, um, many of the graduates had gone away and come home to revive, uh, retire, and to give themselves to the work of, of, of St. Helena and the aura of Penn. There were a tremendously moral and just people, she said, so ethical and so upstanding and such an influence on folks around them. And we actually were having an interesting conversation earlier about this whole phenomenon of, of teaching civic behavior and virtue and how important it is. But it is fascinating to think that that was being taught during Reconstruction and learned. Another key figure in this initiative was Joe McDummock. Joe, uh, and he's the guy on the right. I'm the short guy. Uh, and Joe is the one with this wonderful wisp of white Hare, um, who um, came to Penn in 1964 and had counseled landowners on land retention for 30 years and spent most, really virtually his whole life helping uh, protect uh, land, uh, family land from being uh, sold or sold unnecessarily and or sold at tax sales. He was also a county magistrate and he joined the board of the Conservation League. There was a sense of urgency, we felt. Uh, black uh, people in the U.S. had owned 15 million acres of land at the turn of the century, mostly in the southeast. But by 1990, they owned less than 5 million acres. Beaufort County was a microcosm of this trend. Shortly before we launched the new program, Joe told the Beaufort Gazette, our children and grandchildren still need a place to call home. If we're not careful, we're going to be much worse off in 20 years than we were right after slavery ended. Prior to the launch of the Penn School, St. Helena was threatened by a proposed highway project, highway widening. The, the State Department of Transportation wanted to widen Highway 21 across Ladies Island and St. Helena, um, and it was vehemently opposed by the, C by the residents and by the Conservation League. It was devised, like all highway projects in Columbia, by highway engineers who didn't really know anything about the region, may have never even been there, uh, but they were proposing to change it dramatically. Uh, they were encouraged by some local developers and the project was justified, though, by neither traffic counts uh, nor by population growth projections. And yet it gained traction, as these things seem to do sometimes. And I have to say, in South Carolina, they seem to do that more than they do in other states. But maybe that's just because I grew up here. Uh, fortunately, a tidal wave of citizen protests, including many graduates of the original Penn School, and activists associated with the current Penn Center uh, forced the state officials to um, eventually abandon the St. Helena uh, portion of the project. But the battle galvanized island leaders and raised the awareness that more needed to be done. There needed to be continued vigilance, there needed to be better planning, and um, people came together around this as sort of a, an emergency that gave rise to a, a bigger and a longer term, and in many, many ways, a positive vision for the future of the island. A central figure in the defeat of the Highway 21 widening was Gloria Potts, who left New York, she was from St. Helena, to settle near her grandmother's home 
on St. Helena in 1963. Um, this is Gloria is in the red. And she was a wonderful person in Elaine. Y'all may remember Red, red Piano Gallery. Um, the, this was part of the big fight, Robert Ralph Middleton. Gloria said, years ago when I used to drive home late at night from New York, all the lights would be on in some of the buildings in town. They were in there till all hours studying what to do with our land. And about the Penn School, she said, now we'll be doing the studying and studying how to control our own futures. On Friday, October 22nd, 1993, 40 students comprising the inaugural class of the Penn School for Preservation arrived at the Penn Center, ready to catch the learning again. It was a full weekend of introductory lessons on Sea Island history, on leadership, on community, economic development, and coastal environmental issues. Uh, it was a biracial class composed of 25 community leaders from St. Helena, Ladies Island, Sandy Island, Johns, Wadlaw, and even Sapelo, Georgia, as well as six uh, city and county officials, including two Beaufort County Council members, two Beaufort City Council members, Emmett McCracken, who at the time was the chairman of the Beaufort County Council, was part of it, and the county planner who would oversee the rezoning of the island eventually. The eight-session curriculum based at Penn occurred over four weekends and four uh, single days from the fall of 93 to the spring of 94. After the introductory weekend, the group reconvened to talk about land use planning, then a full weekend on community economic development. St. Helena resident Mary Dawson, who was one of the members of the, group, of the class, described uh, coming to the Penn School for Preservation. She said, we always knew we were hard workers. We always knew we were devoted to our community, but we didn't know that we as African Americans could do the thinking work, the creative work. The School for Preservation brought the community closer together, said Ernestine Atkins, who was on the right. Ernestine attended St. Helena Ep Elementary School in the 50s and majored in uh, education, elementary education at Voorhees College and then earned a master's degree from Pepperdine University. She grew up uh, and accompanied her great-grandmother to an island praise house, which is still there, um, and learn about the family history and the traditions while sitting uh, by the fire at night. And she returned to Beaufort County to teach and later worked for Penn Center and the University of South Carolina. And she also worked in her family's crabbing operation on Ladies Island. She said, I observed that we had a very delicate island that everybody wanted to come to. That opened our eyes to the realization let, we've got to do something to focus on this island and not let things happen that will, that will diminish it. And there was communication with different people from Charleston and Sandy Island, she said, about the school. People who had similar things going on in their communities. We could pull ourselves together and help each other protect these islands and these places. It was fun, she said. I felt it was fun too. It was, I learned um, a lot of things, but one thing I learned, and I've never been able to remember a joke. I can't remember a joke more than about five days. But I learned one, I heard one joke, and I'm not gonna tell y'all tonight, maybe I'll tell you at the end. Um, that was the funniest joke I've ever heard, and I still remember it as testament to how funny it was. Um, Lula Holmes was one of the wonderful members of the group, and she's the one who taught me that joke. Um, after six months of study and research, highlighted by eight work weekends, 37 men and women graduated from the Penn School for Preservation, the, the first new one, on March 20th, 1994. But the outcome of the school was really about more than the graduation, obviously. It was about uh, outcomes that would eventually accrue as a result 
of this work. The graduates have proposed a number of specific things that uh, they then organized around trying to uh, implement. One was uh, they developed, they created a community development corporation on St. Helena to serve as a, as a core in institution under which a number of, of initiatives could be uh, taken could be launched. Business opportunities including a credit union, a food processing center, construction of affordable and durable housing, you know one of the biggest problems on the Sea Islands and many places is that the, these mobile homes, uh, you can't get a mortgage uh, on them beyond just the stuff you buy, get from the mobile home dealer and, and they fall apart um, and yet uh, if you don't have a title to land, sometimes it's, it is hard to get a, a loan to build a bona fide house. And so there's this cycle of economic decline that occurs as a result of that. That was one of the changes that this, the school was attempting to, to make. The um, graduates also decided they formed this Environment and Land Use Committee to undertake a reform of the St. Helena zoning laws required by state law. And at the time, zoning allowed for enough, uh, enough residential development uh, to create a town of about 70,000 people, which is about twice as many people as lived in downtown Charleston on an island whose population at the time was 5,000 people. The current zoning threatened the character also of the corner community, which you know, but this is an old picture and it has been for, for decades and really more than a century a gathering place for the island. Most people agreed uh, that the corners and this, by the way, was where the five-lane road would have gone through. I mean, literally, it wouldn't have taken this, this building, but it would have uh, gone right beside it, and it would have effectively destroyed it as a community gathering place. Uh, meanwhile, in the spring of 94, with support from the Conservation League board members in Beaufort County, including, and many of you all know, I think Billy Kaiserling has been on here recently, his mother Harriet, who was a wonderful person in a thousand ways and one of our board members, entrepreneur, real estate entrepreneur Jennifer Davis, a good friend of mine who was married to Bill Rao at the time, and um, Emery Campbell. We opened an office in downtown Beaufort. That was our first downtown office and it was really energized by this, this uh, excitement around the Penn School and the importance of implementing this this new agenda. And meanwhile, we were planning to move forward with session two of the Penn uh, School Preservation Project. In 95, the school was structured around a series of public charrettes in which participants uh, interacted with professional consultants to talk about specifically what it is that we think the, this area should evolve like. And then these people, some of y'all know some of these people. Uh, that's my friend Georgia Herbert, who you probably don't know from Middleburg, Virginia on the far end. But Emory Campbell, uh, Robert Marvin, who I think many people know, he was a renowned architect in early days on Hilton Head work with Charles Frazier. Uh, Louis A. Bob Dennis, who was head of a great group in Virginia, and Randall Arendt, who really kind of helped re make people rethink what development should, could be like. The uh, master plan that w came out of this effort included an economic feasibility study for the corner, <coughs> a draft set of regulations, and a consensus on how the island should grow, especially to influence the county's uh, rezoning effort that was, that was being launched in uh, 1994. We were able to get a federal grant from Senator Hollings to build the food processing center. And the CDC got it. I say we, I take credit for it, but I didn't really do anything. But the CDC got this grant. Um, that was in the days when uh, senators like Hollings and Thurman could just sort of go over and write it into the budget, you know. Nobody paid any attention. That doesn't happen anymore. 
And in some ways that's good, but maybe in some ways we've lost something. Um, the food processing center was not a complete success. It's still used on and off, but far from realizing the potential that it, that it had. In retrospect, we learned a lot about it, and we, we deployed that knowledge when we opened Grow Food Carolina because we realized that it needed to have the full resources of, in, our, in the case of Grow Food, the Conservation League, to keep it going, get it up and running. And we just didn't, for some reason, didn't appreciate that, that long incubation period. The, there were, though, a number of other very successful efforts that came out. One was the new zoning ordinance, which was uh, the first in the state to substantially uh, downzone rural parts of Beaufort County from, nine, from three units an acre to one unit per three acres, so a ninefold downzoning in density. Uh, the Rural and Critical Lands Program came out of this discussion, which I know many of you are, I know most of you are familiar with. And it was the first purchase of development rights program in South Carolina, and it was funded with uh, a tax uh, increment on property tax and generated a $40 million program. Um, and Kate can correct me in, on all the numbers that I get wrong here. but. Uh, it has also been renewed for another 40 million bucks and has protected well over 20,000 acres of land. The corner community plan did, uh, was adopted, a new plan. It was the final nail in the coffin for the DOT's proposal to five lane Highway 21. Reflect, ref, reflecting on, on the Penn Center, the whole experience, Emory said, I think the most surprising thing was the fact that we could involve ordinary people with policymakers, which meant you could be in the same room with the county council chairman, and it, all of the people were sleeping together in the same building, he said, over the weekend. Um, we could take them out, we could show them the land, we could explain our concerns directly to them. Uh, Jeffrey. Gardner, who was a, a Warsaw resident, Warsaw in, on St. Helena, not in Poland, uh, roomed with uh, the county council chairman, Emma McCracken. And they spoke all night about the needs, and the next morning, Jeffrey got up and showed them thing. Chris is just so tactful, but <laughs> my wife has a hook. In the final analysis, Penn represents a moment of what I call punctuated evolution. This is what Stephen Jay Gould described as how evolution occurs in fits and starts. Um, it was a great moment, and uh, it, it started a lot of things. But this work never, never ends, as you well know, and it really laid the groundwork for for much of what we are working on and we need to do today. Uh, to paraphrase Martin Luther King, I can do that since his building is over there. Penn and the Penn Center have bent the, the arc of history toward justice and cultural preservation. And like everything in life, this work is never done. Thank you very much. office, we have offices in uh, Charleston, Georgetown, and Columbia, and also our um, warehouse, Grow Food Carolina. Dana made a couple of references. How many of you have heard of Grow Food Carolina? Do you familiar? A few people are familiar. Um, I'm actually not going to talk too much about Grow Food Carolina tonight. I want to talk about something else, but if you have any questions, happy to tell you more, and we always love to brag on the work of our local food hub. Uh, helping small farmers and getting local food into local markets and onto uh, local tables. Um, Kate and Ricky ha do tremendous work here uh, uh, out of the office here in, um, in downtown Beaufort. And um, there are many success stories, including the successful hack uh, passage of 
the first countywide plastic bag ban. And, yay. and that has led to um, a lot a, a proliferation of uh, similar local bag bans up and down the coast of South Carolina and even communities uh, inland uh, and um, the, uh, that that movement is growing, and we are working hard on it, and very proud of the uh, uh, efforts that the success is so far. Um, Katie and Ricky have also been uh, very involved and uh, contributed a lot of leadership to the citizen-driven plan to manage growth on Ladies Island. Dana, in his remarks, was talking a lot about the pressures over the years, and those haven't gone away. Um, but there there is an effort to um, manage that growth effectively, and our team is right in the middle of that. So, um, as Chris mentioned, more than a little over a year ago, I took the helm of this incredible organization, taking over from Dana, who founded the organization and, and led it for, for 28 years. And this year, 2019, we're marking our 30th anniversary of working to protect natural landscapes, abundant wildlife, clean water, and the quality of life uh, up and down the coast of South Carolina. And today, and thanks to, Dana, uh, to Dana's um, uh, strong, the strong legacy and Dana's leadership, the Conservation League is one of South Carolina's top conservation advocacy organizations. Uh, we empower citizens. The story that Dana told about the, uh, the, the Penn Center and the Penn School and that entire movement was about empowering citizens to uh, define their own destiny. Uh, we also work with decision makers at every level, uh, local level, state level, often the federal <coughs> level, to advance sound environmental policies on issues like land conservation, natural resource protection, clean, renewable, and affordable energy, uh, managing growth, and, and many more. We are grateful to Dana for his commitment to our organization and for his leadership, uh, his vision, and his passion. And we're now grateful to Dana and Virginia for um, providing us with key stories from the past. He told one story tonight. There are nine other stories in the book that's sitting over there. I hope if you don't have a copy that you will uh, get a copy. Uh, it's important to write these stories down. They are going to help inform us and guide us as we move into the future and seek uh, new opportunities and address new challenges. So you heard a lot from Dana about the Penn Center story. It's an inspiring story. Um, I want to just share very briefly two other initiatives that we are working on right now and um, uh, that are happening, uh, that we're focused on at both the local and the, the statewide levels. Uh, that, and that's land conservation and offshore drilling, two topics which I suspect are important <coughs> and relevant topics for you. Um, on South Carolina's coast, public and private partners have protected more than 1.2 million acres. And this land ethic is particularly evident in this part of our coast, in the uh, south part of the state where we are now. And this, that ethic is particularly important when you consider how quickly the region is growing. Uh, one of the fastest growing uh, uh, places on the east coast. And in fact, in the last decade, Buford County has expanded by more than 24%, and it doesn't sound, seem to show any signs of slowing down. Uh, land protection helps us manage that rapid development and protect what we love about a growing region. And furthermore, when we're strategic about land conservation, it protects regional water quality and mitigates the impacts of increasingly frequent and severe storms that we are experiencing for a number of reasons, including a rapidly changing climate. Um, our team has historically worked hard to organize opposition to annexation and development plans for large Beaufort County properties um, uh, like Benden Plantation, Clarendon Plantation, Mobley Tracks, all of which are now 
uh, protected. And uh, Dana made a reference to this, and I'm sure you are um, <coughs> very familiar with uh, Beaver County's Rural and Critical Lands Program, which has enabled local conservation dollars, which are often matched with private, municipal, state, or federal money to protect 24,000 acres in Beaufort County. And this program, again, I feel like I'm telling you something you probably already know, but in November, we, uh, along with other partners, supported a referendum on the local ballot that designated $25 million toward the Rural and Critical Lands Program. This ballot initiative was successful. And in 2019, we will be working hard to improve the program to encourage more land protection by way of conservation easements and greater public review and engagement on potential uh, projects that are eligible under this program. So the second and final topic that I want to touch on briefly is um, one that is near and dear to me and near and dear, I think, to many of you on the South Coast. And that's our effort to block offshore drilling for oil and gas off South Carolina's <coughs> this coast. Um, you are probably aware that the Trump administration has proposed drilling for oil and gas off the entire Atlantic coast, uh, including South Carolina, uh, and in doing so, ignoring more than uh, 1,200 local, state, and federal officials, more than 350 municipalities nationwide, and 26 coastal communities in South Carolina, uh, many other uh, uh, elected officials, including our governor, Henry McMaster. And dating back to 2014, when the specter of offshore drilling was upon us uh, during the, the previous administration, uh, the city of Beaufort and Beaufort County residents led grassroots efforts to oppose this action. Uh, an initial petition circulated by a Beaufort resident garnered more than 3,500 signatures and Mayor Billy Kaiserling and the city of Beaufort were instrumental in passing the state's first formal resolution opposing offshore drilling, which is something to be very proud of. Uh, followed in suit very quickly by Port Royal, Hilton Head, and uh, uh, cities and counties up and down the South Carolina coast. Under the current proposal, offshore oil and gas drilling in the waters of the Atlantic could begin at some time within the next five years. South Carolinians have been clear and have spoken uh, out against these, uh, the administration's efforts to undertake this activity. It is a bipartisan issue. It's not an environmental issue. It's also an economic issue. And um, uh, local business owners, commercial fishermen, members of the Gullah Geechee Nation, uh, state voices in Washington, like our South Carolina Congressman Joe Cunningham, many others have been very clear that, it, that we don't want this activity uh, off our waters. And including us at the Conservation League, we oppose drilling because we know that the risk is just too great. Offshore drilling threatens our beaches, rivers, streams, salt marshes, um, sea islands. It threatens <coughs> ground pelicans, bottlenose dolphins, sea turtles, and the endangered North Atlantic right whale. Um, this is an incredibly endangered uh, animal. There are less than 500 of them left on the planet. Uh, it also threatens our coastal quality of life and our state's booming uh, $20 billion tour tourism industry. And I actually think that number is higher than that, but that's a big number. Uh, a spill, an incident like the 2010 Deepwater Horizon incident in the Gulf of Mexico, would be devastating to our state, to uh, thriving industries, job growth, fisheries, not to mention the health of the fragile ecosystems that we know and love and that are essential for the health of our environment and our economy. Now, to find offshore oil and gas exploration companies will need to first conduct seismic testing. And that is uh, an activity that involves blasting very loud sounds onto the ocean floor to detect the presence of oil and gas underneath the ocean floor. Um, and we are, like many others, incredibly opposed to this activity. 
marine mammals like the endangered North Atlantic right whale depend on sound to feed and navigate and reproduce, and this activity is dangerous to them and, um, and, and, and interrupts um, their ability to survive. Um, and besides the danger that it that this activity provide uh, offers to to um, marine mammals and other uh, living marine resources, seismic testing opens the door to offshore drilling, and that is a door that we are determined to keep shut. Um, so, in early December, when the federal agency, the National Marine Fishery Service, which is an agency that one of the two federal agencies that have to issue permits to these companies to conduct this activity, uh, issued a permit that would enable them to go into the waters and uh, harm or harass these marine mammals. Uh, we filed a suit um, in federal court along with a number of other national and um, state and local um, in, uh, conservation organizations and uh, a litigation that is mirrored by a second suit brought by coastal municipalities in South Carolina like Buford and Charleston. Uh, nine attorneys generals have intervened in our suit, uh, including South Carolina's Attorney General Alan Wilson. We anticipate that the second round of permits that would enable these companies to put their boats in the water and conduct this activity uh, could happen um, very soon, and we are determined to continue to seek legal recourse uh, if needed to block this dangerous activity and this precursor to offshore drilling. You may have heard recent reports that the administration was uh, will not release its official plans about how it um, plans to move forward with offshore oil and gas drilling in the Atlantic and other parts of the country. And while we could breathe and are breathing a very small sigh of relief about that putting on hold, we are not taking anything for granted and we are going to continue to fight uh, full throttle until the answer is definitive. No drilling, not now, not here, not ever. go on and on, but I'm not going to, and this definitely doesn't want me to. Um, I, I just want to share in closing that we are backed by an active and dynamic community. Many of you are part of our community. If you're not, we hope you will become part of our community. We have more than 20,000 advocates who help us establish good policies and protect the coastal plain and defend it when it needs defending. And there's a lot that needs defending. The work has never been more important and the sense of urgency has never been greater. The task is daunting, but we are up for the challenge. The wholly admirable theme, Dana and Virginia's book, chronicles the first 28 years of conservation success, and I'm looking forward to writing the next chapters of our success with you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. All right.